just what is the greatest adventure you can have in North America on a boat? RV people will drive to the desert to go see the Grand Canyon, maybe do Yellowstone, the West Coast. Airplane people will fly into LAX or JFK, maybe Miami and then on to the tropics. But boat people, when they want a year-long trek to see most of the US and a bunch of Canada on an epic adventure worth thousands of pictures, hundreds of new friends, and the experience of a lifetime, they do the Great Loop. Don't think that the Great Loop is limited to people with trawlers or power boats. Sailboats can come and play too. The northern section of the Loop on the Great Lakes is excellent for sailing, as is the east coast of the US out in the Atlantic. Some of the best sailing I've ever done was off the coast of Georgia and the Carolinas. Yes, we have to drop our masts for the canals and the locks, but you'll find facilities in place to help you do that. I've done it and it really isn't that hard. Plus, an argument can be made that to do the Great Loop, you might be more comfortable on a sailboat anyway. Traversing the Great Lakes or the Gulf with the sails up can be a much better experience than rolling around on a trawler. And my keel depth of 5 foot 5 never really got in the way. The NOAA website says, the Great Loop is a continuous waterway that recreational mariners can travel that includes part of the Atlantic, Gulf intercoastal waterways, the Great Lakes, Canadian Heritage Canals, and the inland rivers of America's heartland. Anyone who completes the journey is then named an official looper. America's Great Loop Cruisers Association says, loopers cruise the 6,000 mile Great Loop route aboard their own boats, completing a circumnavigation of the eastern US and part of Canada via mostly protected inland waterways. The Great Loop route follows the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway, the Chesapeake Bay, and the New York Canals northward, goes across the Great Lakes, south on the inland rivers, and then east Gulf Coast to complete the loop. I'll leave links to those resources in the description because the NOAA and AGLCA will be definitive places for information if you want to go and do this thing. And if you're anything like me after this video, you'll want to. There's a great video on the Great Loop YouTube channel by Kim Russo, a link to as well, where she walks cruisers through the process. In the video, she says, one of the biggest questions the AGLCA America's Great Loop Cruisers Association gets is, how hard is it? How technical to complete the loop? Kim answers, it's not a very technically challenging trip. It's not an ocean crossing where you're out in the middle of the ocean without access to services. And the boat skills you'll need are easy to obtain. You can take safe boating courses and get just about everything you'll need from local power squadrons or the Coast Guard classes. There are a couple of different routes to the loop. You can do it entirely in the US if you want to, though you'll miss some of the highlights if you do that. If you do the whole thing, you'll see 15 different states and Canadian provinces and make landfall in two different countries, Canada and the US. Some loopers sidebar over to the Bahamas too. That's an option. On the shortest route, you'll cover 5,250 miles, or you can sidetrack from time to time and do 7,000 or even 10,000 miles. You'll go through 100 plus locks, and all this is usually done in a year's time, but the loop has been done as quickly as two and a half months, while some cruisers will spend years on this journey, sort of taking it all in. Part of the beauty of the trip is that it's entirely up to you. There is a beaten path and a fairly set schedule if you just want to go with the flow. And I mean that literally. Timing is usually set by seasonal weather in the north, hurricane season in the south, and lock schedules on the canals. You'll want to be around the Great Lakes in the summer and then toward Florida in the winter. The NOAA explains, if you start in Chicago, continue south in a counterclockwise direction to take advantage of the river currents, that run into the Mississippi River. While a few people stay on the Mississippi all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, most loopers choose to exit at the Tennessee River to avoid heavy barge traffic on the larger waterway. 
This path leads to the Tennessee Tong Bigby Waterway, which also flows to the Gulf. Regardless of the southern route selected, boaters can float downstream to the warm waters of the Gulf and explore the Florida Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. From there, crews east on the Gulf's intercoastal waterway. While soaking up some Florida sun, visit the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Then travel north up the intercoastal waterway and discover the Grays Reef National Marine Sanctuary. Continue north on the intercoastal to New York City. From the Big Apple, it's a straight shot up the Hudson to the Erie Canal. Then head west across to the Great Lakes. Boaters may visit Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary when sailing up Lake Huron and then finally returning back to Chicago. A tip here, ask your boat insurance company about doing the Great Loop. Some insurance companies have stipulations on how far south you can go and when. Often you are required to wait until November before heading too far south in the US to avoid hurricane season. For this reason, a lot of loopers end up waiting somewhere in Alabama until they're allowed further south. I'll leave a link to this interactive Google map by Captain John in the description. Kim from the ALGCA goes on to say, if you're starting from Charleston, South Carolina, for example, you would start in the springtime and head north. The loop is generally done counterclockwise, so you can take advantage of the currents in the river system. It has been done in a clockwise direction, but it does take more fuel and more time to buck the currents. The AGLCA are seeing more and more people doing the Great Loop in segments, meaning that they boat for a few weeks or maybe a few months, whatever their time frame allows, and then they leave the boat to return home and take care of business, family needs, whatever that might be. So people are looping just in the summers. Some people are looping for a few weeks and then going home for a few months. It's really up to you. One of the advantages of doing it in segments is that you have plenty of time to plan the next segment while you're returning home, and you're also not locked into hitting some of these rule of thumb time markers. For example, you could spend an entire summer on the Chesapeake Bay and not see all of the nooks and crannies that are there. So if you're looping in segments, you've got the advantage of being able to spend the whole summer in a specific area. If you're doing the all at once trip, you need to be all the way through Canada during the summer months and really can't spend a lot of time on the Chesapeake Bay because you need to keep moving so you can get through the Great Lakes and through Chicago before the cold weather hits. We just stress that you really need to make it your own trip and do it in a way that speaks to you. Practical Sailor is a new channel and we hope you like what you find here. Please take a minute to subscribe to this video and give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. We've got an office bet going here. If we get a thousand comments on this video, my boss said he'll do the Great Loop in his amphibious car. And likely the biggest question anyone has, which boat do I use? Kim says a lot of loopers will start in Florida. There's a trend to buy the boat in Florida, do the loop, and then sell the boat back in Florida again. So for us ambitious future loopers, Florida might be the easiest place to find the boat. A boat that may have already done the loop and already been outfitted thusly. And for boats, there are endless options. Conventional wisdom of yesteryear was to buy the smallest boat you and your company would feel comfortable on. Smaller means less fuel, easier to dock, less to go wrong. But in more recent years, people have been leaning further into comfort and amenities. Though some hard restrictions do apply. The loop has been done in everything from a kayak to a 70 foot yacht, including a lot of sailboats, stepping and unstepping the mast as needed. The AGLCA says the lowest unavoidable fixed bridge on the Great Loop is currently charted at 19.6 feet and is located at mile 300 on the Illinois River. The boat you intend to use for the loop must be able to clear that bridge, so sailboats, the mast comes down. Some members with taller boats are able to get under the 19.6 foot bridge by lowering antenna, radar arches, things like that. About 8% of member boats are sailboats. And Kim says most sailboats will need to step and unstep the mast to clear bridges in Chicago and of course upstate New York on the canals. Your choice of waterways through New York State and into Canada will also be dependent on your air draft. If you can clear a 15 foot bridge, you have the option to take the historic Erie Canal 
to its western terminus in Lake Erie. If you can clear a 17-foot bridge, you can do the triangle loop that takes you into Lake Champlain and through the St. Lawrence Seaway into Lake Ontario. As an additional option on the triangle loop, if you can clear the many 8-foot bridges, you can take the historic, charming, free Lachine Canal through Montreal rather than the Seaway Locks. The final option is to take the Erie Canal to the Oswego Canal to Lake Ontario. That route requires you to clear 21-foot bridges. Your air draft will also dictate which route you take off Lake Michigan. To cruise the Chicago River through downtown, you must be able to clear a 17-foot bridge. If you can't clear that, you'll have to take the Cal Sag Canal, which is south of Chicago to the Illinois River. On water draft, they say it's recommended that your boat for the Great Loop not have a depth much greater than 5 feet. The Canadian canals are maintained at a depth of 6 feet, but you are required to contact them and sign a waiver if you draw over 5. You'll also have trouble during low tide on some areas of the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway if you draw more than 5. I've done that in 5 foot 5 and I was okay. And there may be other areas that are difficult to navigate with a draft much deeper than 5 feet. That said, many boats with greater than 5 have successfully completed the loop. On length, there's no particular restriction for doing the great loop on the length of the boat. Of course, the larger the boat, the more costly it is to tie up at marinas, they charge by the foot, and the more difficult it becomes to get in and out of some of the shallower or skinnier waters on the Great Loop. In reality, however, water draft and air draft will become a problem long before length. The Trent Severn does have a maximum length of 84 feet, but if you exceed that, there are alternate routes. It's hard to imagine a pleasure boat that is too beamy for the Great Loop. The only areas where Maximum beam comes into play are in the locks. Most of the locks in the U.S. were built for commercial traffic, so pleasure craft have no size challenges in those locks. The smallest width for a lock we know of is in Port Severn on the Trent Severn waterway at a width of 23 feet. If your boat beam exceeds that, there are alternative routes that don't require you to cruise the Trent Severn. On fuel, the furthest distance without a fuel stop along the Great Loop is a route between Hoppies in Kimswick, Missouri and the upper Mississippi River in Pataka, Kentucky. This is a distance of about 200 miles. Some loopers whose boats don't have the necessary range carry additional fuel cans and drums or bladders on the deck for that section of the route. On boats, it's usually helpful to look at which boats are actually being used by other people. According to the Great Loop Channel and the AGLCA, while people do the Great Loop on sailboats quite often, the number one boat in 2023 to complete the loop was a main ship trawler. These are uber popular and the price point makes them relatively accessible, but also because they're so popular, they come with their own exit strategy. After you complete the loop, a main ship is easy to sell. As someone who has done about half of the Great Loop myself twice, both times on a sailboat, I can say with certainty that it's worth doing. In upstate New York, you get so much small town America. The historic Erie Canal is fascinating. The locks are a lot of fun. Down the East Coast, you see Manhattan, Sandy Hook, Cape May, Annapolis, Norfolk, the Carolinas, Savannah, St. Augustine. The scenery is amazing. You'll meet people you'll never forget and have the experience of a lifetime. The best advice I can give you other than take your time and enjoy the ride is go do it. Make a plan, set a date, buy a boat and do it. You won't regret it, but you will regret not doing it.